All right, so we are in a series called Love Never Lies, and what we're doing is we're talking about how Jesus always told the truth, and Jesus confronted sin, he confronted the demonic, uh, and he wasn't passive and tolerant of things, he addressed them, he actually talked to them. So I'm just going to tell you that today's message is going to be a little tough to hear, and the reason I say it's a little tough to hear is because as I began to study the the topic, I began to see this in myself, and I had to do some repentance this week over things that I didn't recognize, but once I dug into it, it, it made a lot more sense, and I'm going to be doing a lot of setup this week, so we, ta- or we talked about Jesus always told the truth because love never lies, so he told the truth to Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You are operating in a spirit that is not of me, and you're in the flesh. He told the truth to the woman called in adultery. He said, go now and sin no more. He told the woman at the well that she was living with a man she was not married to for the purpose of opening up the spiritual conversation. And in all of these people, Jesus was in the midst of discipling, but there was a group of people. There was a group of religious leaders that Jesus told the truth to. And listen to me, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't passive, and it wasn't tolerant. As a matter of fact, he was very direct and very confrontational, and this group was called the Pharisees. You knew we had to get to this at some point in the series. We're here. We're going to talk about the pharisaical spirit, and this is my confession to you today. I do not know the Bible from front to back. I do not have answers to every question you ask, but I want you to hear me loud and clear. I am willing to study and find them. But hear me out. There are 66 books, hundreds of stories, 40 authors. There are over three quarter of a million words written thousands of years ago in a different language. It's a tough thing. It's a lot. It can be really overwhelming. But if you get in there, the Spirit gives you revelation and you start figuring these things out. So I don't proclaim to know it all. And I will not come up with an answer on the spot to try to impress you. Won't do it. But I do love looking at the mysteries in the Bible because it's all there. And the Spirit guides us into truth so he can open it all up and help us to understand And I also believe there was a time when I was younger that I thought I knew more than I actually did. How many of you are old enough to figure out the older you get, the less you know you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like every time I get further into a study on something, I realize that there's so much further to go because I didn't know I was so far behind until I started studying and I got a third of the way, but I don't even know if it's a third of the way. It could be one one hundredth of the way, but I think it's, it's, uh, anyways, I'll go on. Uh, and, And oftentimes when I was a younger preacher, I would listen to what other people who I respected would say, and I would regurgitate that so people would think I was smart. And out of all that, I recognize that there's a really heavy weight when it comes to spiritual teaching. There's a very heavy weight when it comes to trying to open up the Bible and help others understand it. You can't fake it, and you can't fake it till you make it. You go through stages where it's obvious you're trying your best, but the truth is it's a growing process. But then there are, there are stages that you go through where all of a sudden you realize you're just dropping revelations that he gave you and people's eyes and ears are being opened. They're saying, I never understood it that way. Is Kevin Harrigan here this morning? No. no. Okay. Man, his wife's birthday, so he doesn't want to take her to church? Wow. <laughs> Kevin. Kevin. Kevin is studying. (laughs) Kevin is studying Moses and the Exodus. So don't be down on Kevin. He's in his word, okay? Uh, And he was shooting revelation to me, things I'd never heard or understood. It's incredible what the Holy Spirit can do. But I see young leaders who are still trying to impress other people. And I see those who are not learning anything new, but they're still trying to impress other people. And honestly, I recognize that I can do the same if I'm not honest with myself. Because you cannot lead and hold on to pride. 
And you cannot lead by building yourself up and tearing others down. And you cannot sustain true leadership without recognizing your own faults. And I pray that the hard lessons that we learn are not too brutal on us and that we survive long enough to stop our performances and submit ourselves to the God who wants to move us forward in the spirit and not the flesh. Because let me tell you, I have already messed up enough times to learn to shut my mouth. Why am I saying all this? What would, what would be the point of that buildup? Because today I want to talk to you about the Pharisees of Jesus' day and of today. I want to talk about those who claim to know the truth but spend their time condemning others. I want to speak to those who spend their spiritual leadership time criticizing other Christians. I want to talk to those who are so insecure in their faith that they must tear others down with poor arguments to feel better about themselves. Hang on. I want to talk to those who believe they are impressing others by telling everyone on Facebook that they know the Bible better than you do. Oh, yeah, I'm going there. I want to talk to those who believe they're so spiritually mature that other people just don't get it, and hopefully one day you'll become as mature as they are. And I want to talk to those who have YouTube channels who the sole purpose is to condemn other Christians who don't agree with their interpretations. I want to talk to you about those who crush the souls, crush the souls of other uh, people by professing that no one knows the Holy Spirit like they do. I want to talk to those who always have to one-up you on anything you say about the Lord because they know him better and they are closer to godliness than you are. I'm almost done. <laughs> and finally, I want to talk to the person who last week on live stream commented, you need to get rid of that pastor and get you a good Baptist pastor. No, 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 listen to me. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. I was Baptist for 20 years. I taught in the Baptist churches. Listen to me. I have a master's degree from a Baptist seminary. I know what you believe. And I am inviting you to come to my office and sit down and open up the word because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you and open up an entire thing that you haven't seen yet. Come, come. Listen to me. Come and let's reason together. Like the Bereans, let's open up the book and see what it says. And I'm willing to hear from you, and all I want is for you to be willing to hear from me. And maybe both of us will hear from the Holy Spirit, and our lives will change. So I want you to know that I'm not angry, I'm not bitter. I'm not being self-righteous. I'm just tired of the super spiritual elite that show me why Jesus always confronted the Pharisees. I'm not arguing doctrine or theology here. I'm asking, where is the fruit in this type of hyper-spiritual, I know more than you approach? Where's the fruit in that? I put Jesus as Lord on the Facebook and they have to say, oh, Jesus is the Lord of Lords. <laughs> Hear me out. Why? Why does someone do that? I want you to stop and think why, what's in their heart that would create a need to one up me on a truth I have proclaimed about the Lord. You put on, on, on Facebook, the spirit of the Lord is within me. And they say the spirit of the Lord is in every believer. He will never leave you or forsake you. Why are you doing that? How does that in any way benefit any of us for you to show you can do one step better? You know what? I can list out the rest of the chapter if you want me to. And then I've one upped you. And all we've done is make each other look foolish. But I think we do these things because we're pharisaical. 
Why do I say we're pharisaical? Because you, your desire is for people to know that you know more or you can say it better than they can. I'm sad. I'm sad in a world where there is such division such division in our country, such division in our races, such division in our politics, such division in all of those things, and yet Christians would spend their time creating division among Christians. We're following the devil's plan of division. Isn't there enough Satan in the world for us to do battle against Satan instead of against each other? Now, so that I say it, so that you don't have to go face to, post it on Facebook, yes, there is bad doctrine and bad teaching in the church. But why are we espousing it on Facebook instead of going to a brother or sister and sitting down and say, let's reason together? Why? We're doing it because we want the world to know we are more spiritual than them. We have higher understanding than them. We are better than them. We've never talked to them, but we're going to go tell the world we know better than they do. I want to go see how Jesus addressed the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Matthew 23. <laughs> By the way, I'm not mad at anybody. <laughs> I'm not pointing out a post that you did last week. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm seeing. I'm seeing in the church, and it's disheartening. People in the church trying to one-up each other spiritually. Oh, we're more filled than you guys are. We know the Lord better than you know the Lord. It's just Matthew 23, 1. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to the disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do and to observe. I'll get back to that. It actually sounds like he's starting off kind of honoring the Pharisees. He said, hey, they sit in the chair of Moses. What is that? Go back to Exodus, Exodus 18. We're talking about the actual Moses here. And in 13, it came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood about Moses from morning until evening. Now, when Moses' father-in-law saw that all he was doing for the people, he said, what is this thing you're doing for all the people? Why do you sit as a judge alone and all of the people stand about you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. And when they have a dispute, it comes to me and I judge between a man and his neighbor and I make known the statutes of God and his law. The Pharisees sit in the chair of Moses like Moses in the desert. Part of the Pharisee's job is to hear your case and present to you what the word of God, what the law would want you to do, how the law would need you to respond. So Jesus consider, continues and says, but do not do according to their deeds, for they are saying things and do not do them. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They don't practice what they preach. And probably the most familiar word that we're all aware of that describes that situation is hypocrisy. They're full of instructions for you, but they don't live their life like they're asking you to live yours. Verse four, they tie up heavy burdens and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. What is he saying? He's saying there are people that will tell you, and listen to me, today, there are people that will tell you, you must have a quiet time in the morning to be right with God. There are people who will tell you revival will only come when everyone repents and gets on their faces. The people today will tell you the Holy Spirit only speaks to you if you're quiet and still. And I'm not saying there's no truth in these statements. What I'm saying is they've decided to break your relationship with God down to a new Testament law and hold you to the new law that they think we're under. Still trying to impress God with what they do. And most will tell you that they don't do that for themselves anymore, but they did early on so that they would have a good relationship with God and that's what you need to do. In other words, you do this, but I don't need to do it anymore. 
Verse five, but they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. This is huge. It's huge. This is spiritual pride. This is whitewashed tombs, clean on the outside, dirty on the inside. Dirty on the inside with arrogance, with self-righteousness, with pride and insecurity. Look how he goes on. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels of their garment. In that day, the Pharisee had a certain dress that he was required to wear. And on that, it had a phylactery and it had tassels. You all know about those, right? Sure, let's go find out what that is. In Deuteronomy eleven eighteen, you shall therefore impress these words of mine, God is saying, on your heart and on your soul. Now watch. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall, uh, they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Now there were similar verses about having tassels and where they're located. So the Pharisee is saying a phylactery is a small box and in that box it held scriptures and they would put it on their forehead and they would wear one on their arm. Why? Because they're binding the word of God on their forehead and their arm. But this is what they were doing. Look at the size of my phylactery. It's bigger than it needs to be so that everyone can see it. I mean, it comes out so many ways in the church. You see somebody on Facebook saying, here's another picture of me praying at the beach in the morning. Here are the seminary degrees that I have. You may not know this, but I'm ordained and I've been at your church for a week and you still haven't asked me to teach. I learned about this. I learned about this early on. I read Exodus 20, 25. God is speaking and he said something. And in the middle of me reading it, the Holy Spirit said, boom, let me show you what that means for you. 2025. If you make an altar of stone for me, God says, you shall not build it of cut stones. Your version may say hewn stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. In other words, he's saying, I want you to go get an altar and I want you to build it of stones and, and they need to be the stones just that you get them 12 stones high, whatever the altar requirement was at that time. But don't cut on it. Don't cut the stones. Don't break the stones in some way. And he is saying, if you cut the stone, if you make the altar pretty, if you cut de uh, decorations into it, it shows the work of the man and you will profane it. In other words, they should come to worship me, not the beauty of the stonework you did. And let me tell you how he stabbed me in the heart with it. At the time, I was teaching a Sunday school class at a Baptist church. <laughs> I was walking people through the Old Testament from the beginning to the end, and that's the scripture I came across. And you know what he said? Listen to yourself when you say you teach an adult Sunday school class and ask yourself, why are you using the word adult? Because you want to cut stone in there. You want people to know you're not a kid Sunday school teacher. You're teaching people in the Bible and it's adults and it's a serious deal. Verse six, they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They love special seating and doesn't Pastor Todd have a reserved seating? So he's a Pharisee. <laughs> maybe, maybe, or maybe he just needs easy access to the stage. And by the way, if you think that's a good seat in the synagogue, come and sit over here for a while. I don't get to see anything but everybody's profile. I got to look around the people to even see the screen there or break my neck to look at that one. That's not a good seat in this house. Anyways, seven. And respectful greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by men. This one gets under my skin. I'm just going to tell you it does. The titles that you must call me as a spiritual leader. Senior lead, chief apostle, Doug. <laughs> ah, hear me out. If you need a title to be respected, then your fruit is not obvious. Oh, I'm gonna say it again. 
If you need a title to be respected, then your fruit is not obvious. People should call you by what your life demonstrates, not by the paper you have on the wall. Does this mean you can't call me pastor? No. It means if you call me pastor or Todd or hey buddy, I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer and say, what can I do for you? I don't care what you call me. As long as when you're going to Longhorn and you're going to have the outlaw ribeye, you call me. <laughs> Verse eight, but do not be called rabbi. Oh, you got to watch this. There's some revelation here. Do not be called rabbi for one, capital O, talking divine. One is your teacher and you are all brothers. I want you to remember the word unity as I say that. Nine, do not call anyone on earth your father for one, capital O, is your father who is in heaven, verse 10. And do not be called leaders for one is your leader, and that is Christ. Now, I don't know if you just saw it, but what he just said, the teacher is the Holy Spirit, Father is God, and leader is Jesus Christ. Oh, let me read it again. Don't be called rabbi, for one is your teacher. What does the Holy Spirit do? He leads us into all truth. Do not call anyone your father, for your father is the one who is in heaven, and do not be called leaders, for the leader, that is Christ. But what this does is bring up another pharisaical problem. People who say, I don't need a teacher, I have the Holy Spirit. Those people that just moaned, you know people like that. I don't need to hear from you because I hear from God. I don't need to respect an authority structure because Jesus is my leader. I listen to the Holy Spirit and I hear different things than the pastor is hearing. Friend, listen to me. If you're hearing different things than the pastor is hearing, then there's not a good eldership in place at your church. Or you're not hearing from God. That's not arrogant. I'm saying there's unity in the spirit and there's division created by the enemy. And where we're going and what we're doing should be something we all agree and buy into. And the Pharisee has a problem because Jesus just gave to the church teachers in Ephesians 4.11. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, and some as teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building of the body of Christ. What did he just say? Yes. You're going to learn from the Holy Spirit, but I'm giving you teachers too. Yes, you're going to learn from the Holy Spirit, but I'm giving you prophetic people too. Yes, you're going to learn from the Holy Spirit, but I'm giving you pastors to help you figure it all out. Let's go back to the verse 11. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Jesus is saying that one of the problems with the Pharisees is they're not humble people. They want recognition. Please hear my heart on this. I know this is heavy today. I'll find a way to pull it out. Many of the people you know that need recognition, they have wounded souls. Listen, if you don't see this, please step into grace for a moment. They have been hurt in the past and they need to be recognized and heard now because they were not in the past or they were heard in the past and then feel like they got pushed to the side and now they want to be heard again. So oftentimes when somebody needs recognition where I need to be on the prophetic team, you need to let me speak in church. Why don't you give me the mic? It's because there's a hurt they're trying to fill from their own past of something they did and they wanna feel that way again. I'm not saying there aren't true prophetic people. You know I believe that. You know we operate in it. But I watch people who don't even realize they're operating in the spirit of offense. But as a believer, we have to seek humility, 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. I'm gonna read that again. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. 
please wait for God to exalt you at the proper time because if you try to get yourself exalted at an improper time, you're in the flesh and it will not succeed. You will be frustrated. I can't tell you how many people I see that's, hey, uh, you know, would you let me do this? I want to be on this team. I want to teach this class. I want to do this. And all I can say is, you're not ready yet. You're not ready yet. Oh, no, no, but you, listen, when I was younger, I would say, listen, I got a teacher, I'll let you teach. And then I suffered the consequences of they weren't ready yet. God will exalt you. How does he do that? He puts that desire in your heart and then delivers it to the leadership over you and says, it's time for this person to move up. It's time for this person to move forward. Wait for that because anything else you do is gonna be in the flesh and it will be unfruitful. I want to explain a little bit about what hypocritical spiritual leaders bring to a church or to Facebook. Now, hypocritical spiritual leaders, they bring a feeling in the rest of the body that you can never meet up to God's expectations. They condemn you of your Christian walk. They bring condemnation. They bring a sense of unworthiness in your spiritual life and a legalistic walk where you're trying to use behavior modification to please God instead of your actual identity in Christ. I mean, none of that sounds to me like a loving father and how he works in our life. So does Jesus tell the truth about the Pharisees? Yeah. And these are not kind and loving statements Jesus makes. He's not trying to protect their feelings. He's telling the disciples that hypocrisy, self-righteousness, pride, and insecurity are not good things. And that's the truth because love never lies. Jesus told the Pharisees, you shut off the kingdom of heaven to people trying to enter. He said, you devour widows. You make converts twice the son of hell as you are, and you don't understand what's important in the temple, and you tithe on your spices, but you neglect justice, mercy, and faithfulness, and you're full of self-indulgence, and you're focused on appearance instead of on the change of heart, and you separate yourselves from your father so you don't have to take responsibility for what they taught you. And it was all the truth. How do I know that? Because Jesus said it. The Pharisees were people who had messed up priorities and a lack of understanding. They believed that everyone should adhere to rules to please God. However, they didn't adhere to the same rules that they tried to enforce. A few months ago, someone came to me and said, Pastor, I'd like to speak with you after church. Okay. I was available. We sat down and they pulled out a list. And they said, this is the requirements we have to attend your church. <laughs> so we just want to make sure that you agree to all these. Jan is my witness. I said, before you read me a single word, I want you to hear me. If the Holy Spirit is not telling you to come to this church, do not come here. And if the Holy Spirit is telling you to come to this church, then you get in here and you listen and you learn. Not a single doctrine or theology question was asked, but I answered all of her questions. You're stunned. I'm stunned at how many people have a list like this that, you know, you, you get these emails, say, does your church believe in this and do they do this and do that? Listen, doctrine and theology is important. You can find our, uh, our faith statements on the website. I'm more than happy for you to shoot me a question about doctrine and theology. And I understand people's desire to be in a place of truth. But listen to me. Go where the Holy Spirit leads you to go. And if you come with a list of requirements, please, if you're going to take notes, write fast, but write this down. If you come to any church with a list of requirements to see if the church is gonna fail at any of your requirements, then you will always be looking for what is wrong and I guarantee you, you will eventually find something wrong and a reason to leave. We're not done. If you come to any church looking for fruit, 
to see if that church is producing fruit, then you will be looking for what is right. And I guarantee you, you will always have a reason to stay. Why? Because fruit is worth fighting for. That's your Facebook post. <laughs> fruit is worth fighting for because one of two things will happen if you're looking for fruit. You will say, the fruit here is worth fighting for, so I will stay and see if I can understand the way the things are that they're teaching them because maybe I need to learn something. Or you will say, I don't wanna do damage to the fruit that's being produced, so I will wait until the Holy Spirit asks me to speak, if he does, and I will let him guide me into speaking when, where, and to whom he tells me to, and I'll promise you that won't be on Facebook, because maybe you're here to help the church spiritually. And if that's true, you will not operate in the flesh because a fruit of the spirit is patience. And if you're operating in the spirit, you're going to be patient if he told you to come here and you see problems. This is what he's gonna tell you. Sit down, I'll tell you when to speak. So an actually mature believer will go to the church the Spirit leads them to and will wait on the Lord for the things I don't understand yet because I don't wanna create division and condemnation. And if you are a person who always finds people are more immature than you spiritually and you constantly feel the need to correct them, you are a Pharisee. Sorry, but love never lies. I believe in revived church. I believe this is a fruitful church. I'm willing to risk that by asking a show of hands to see if anybody agrees with me. Don't raise your hand yet. I'm gonna ask you if you've experienced fruit here. I got a list of about six of them. And I just want you to raise your hand if you have. There is joy in this house. Fruit of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit. There is scriptural revelation in this house. The Holy Spirit illuminates the scriptures. There is Christian fellowship in this house. Hey, you know, I, I used to be a small groups pastor and I would say this and it was intentionally mean, but it's okay, I, I, I matured. <laughs> I would say, if you have come here and you can't find friends, it's because you don't know how to make friends. Let me tell you what typically happens when a couple leaves here and says, well, we couldn't make any friends. We don't have any friends. My first question is always, who did you go to and invite them out to lunch? Oh, nobody? Who did you go to and say, good morning, how are you? And ask them the question, we, oh, nobody? Okay, now I know why you don't have friends. You don't know how to make friends. You're, you, listen to me. For some of you who are feeling that way right now, this is what I want to tell you. Watch during the welcome time you see those people who are sitting and they're not talking to anybody? You know what they're doing? They're waiting for you to come over and say something to them. So if you're sitting and not doing anything, look for someone else who is sitting and not doing anything because they're waiting for somebody and it might as well be you. Hey. There is healing and deliverance in this house. Come on, stick around, you will see it. There are salvations in this house. We share the gospel and people respond. Anybody, come on. There is territory influence in this house. Come on. Just look at the elections. There are Pharisees in this house. I love those people I went. <laughs> I'm all in for whatever the fruit is. Wait, that's not a good fruit. <laughs> What's my point? My point in this entire message today is a singular focus. We need to look at ourselves. Because sometimes that Christian post on Facebook is nothing more than a pharisaical spirit that's driving someone else away and saying, why do you always have to do that to me? Why do you always one-up me? Why are you trying to prove you're so hyper, super spiritual and mature 
it's just turning me off and I don't want to deal with you because all you're going to do is condemn me and make me feel like I'm less of a Christian because you know more than I do. Jesus was harsh with the religious leaders of that day and I believe he knew the Pharisees would never repent. Save maybe Nicodemus. Jesus told them the truth about themselves in a very direct way, but I want you to hear me. Jesus could do that. You know why? Because he's Jesus. For you and I, we have to consider we're on a journey of learning and growing in Christ, and we are all at different levels of that growth and understanding. I'm almost done. We must, we must show grace to those who are earlier on in their journey. I've been a Christian since I was 20 and I was raised in a church home. But some of us here have been a Christian for less than a month. Do I want to turn them away by saying you don't get it? We must realize that there are people who are farther along in their journey with the Holy Spirit and stop getting angry and receive from them. There are elders who can speak into you. There are people who can teach you. There are people gifted by God to be further along in certain areas than you. Can we just say, I'd like to learn from you? We must examine ourselves to see if we have any pharisaical tendencies in us. And we must ask the Holy Spirit to convict us of the truth about ourselves and we must increase the fruit of the Spirit in this house. And we got to stop being Pharisees on Facebook. Spade a spade. God is love. Jesus is God. Jesus gave us the Spirit of truth, and we must walk in truth because love never lies. Stand to your feet, please. I'll ask my altar ministers to come forward. Hey, if this is your first Sunday with us, come back. <laughs> Give it another shot. Messages aren't always like this. Honestly, this is a message to the body of Christ. This is a message to the self-inflicted damage we're doing to the kingdom of God. This is where we turn inward. I want to tell you a quick story if I can. I was in a manufacturing world and I took a job as a consultant to help someone out in a company. That person who led the company was a Christian, had been all his life, been very involved in the churches that he was in. I got an invite by the first church to become a full-time minister in their church. So I had to go and tell my boss, I've got to resign because in two weeks I'm starting at the church. This is what this wise, seasoned, experienced man told me. He said, before you do that, do you realize that the church is the only organism that eats its own young alive? Because he understood how it is sometimes in church. We have such a desire to serve God that we'll do anything we think is right before God without even considering the Holy Spirit telling us whether or not we should be doing that. Here's my message for today, and I hope to send you away in a, in a good mood. When it's gone, when the pharisaical spirit gets washed out, when you realize, I'm going to stop doing these things. I didn't realize I hurt somebody. I've got somebody to call and apologize to because I did that to him, and I don't want to be that kind of person. It opens the door for God to send blessings and scriptural revelation. All of a sudden, things begin to make more sense. Uh, there's an individual I know that's in this church who finally forgave someone he needed to forgive. And now God is talking to him in scripture like he's never known before. Listen to me. Here's what I want to say to you this morning. I want you to have it all. I want you to have the best. I want you to have God's blessing on you. I want the scriptural revelation to be open to you. I want your understanding and your spiritual eyes and your ears to be open. And some of us don't even realize we're the problem. We're the problem because we're so fixated on doing something for God and showing everybody we're for God that we don't even realize we're acting like Pharisees. There's things in my life I have to change. Times I have to recognize what I'm saying and to who and why. 
Father God, in the name of Jesus, just here this morning, touch us, Holy Spirit. Touch us. And if there be any unclean thing in us, I pray that you would send a strong Ruach breath right through us to blow it out. That darkness would not exist in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of light. That we would be humble enough to say, I need to think about this before I post. I need to think about this before I talk to people. I need to think about this before I need to try to prove someone else is wrong about what they believe. Humble us so that we can be exalted in the proper time. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any reason for prayer, any reason for prayer, you got a physical issue, you got a relationship issue, you got a financial issue, you got stress, you got anxiety, you want to be baptized in the Spirit, any reason at all, these folks are up here ready to minister to you. Come on, let them pray for you. Come on. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.